Uh, this is Tanya Pearson interviewing Terry Nunn on June 20th in Santa Rosa Valley for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. So nice to meet you. I'm so excited. <laughs> thank you. I'm excited too. Um, I like what you're doing. Oh, thank you. So you said, I know that you've watched a few of them. Yeah. Uh, so we start way at the beginning. Okay. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in a place in California, Southern California called The Valley until I was 14 and then we moved to another place in Southern California called Santa Monica and I went to Santa Monica High School. What did your parents do for a living? My father started out as an MGM contract player he was like a rock star in his time because he did movies as an actor with Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney and Spencer Tracy. Uh, Men of Boys Town was with Spencer Tracy. Strike of the Band with uh, Judy Garland and, and Mickey Rooney. Oh, what were some of their ones? Many, I mean, you can look him up. His name was Larry Nunn. And that was when he was a kid. He was a prodigy violin player in Seattle, where his family's from. And then they signed him and he moved to Hollywood and did that until he was 19. And then he was uh, uh, drafted into the Navy. And when he came out, they didn't want him anymore because he wasn't a kid anymore. And he, I think he tried for a little while, but not really hard. And then he met his first wife. He had three girls, my sisters, my half sisters. And then he met my mom when he was like 32 or three and they stayed together for 12 years. And he was, he was an alcoholic. He just never really found his way again. He did odd jobs until he decided to open a record store. And that was in 1965 or six. And our whole family ran this record store and then he opened another one and then he opened a third one and this was like oh my god i mean this was before the big chains came in and that was the time that i saw him the happiest and we were the happiest as a family i loved the music i got to run the cash register and I was like eight years old and, and people, you know, it was just the best time to be in music, you know, the Beatles and the Stones and Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan. I mean, it was just popping. And my brother was older than me. He was a teenager. So everybody wanted to be his friend because he had the record store. And it was a magical time, but the chains came in and killed us because we couldn't compete with their prices. You know, they were buying in such huge bulk that there was no way we could price our stuff and, and survive. So the stores died and then he kind of went into odd jobs again and drinking a lot. He was an artist, he was a painter. So that's what he did and mom, was an executive secretary to a lot of famous people, uh, Groucho Marx. She was his personal secretary for a while. She was a very organized person and it was so invaluable to people and to the family too. And then she found astrology and it was about two years before I was born, she got into astrology and this was at the end of the 50s and nobody was into astrology. It was not considered cool at all. But she did it, and she got more and more into it. And then in the 60s, it started to gain some recognition and some acceptance. 
And she got very good at it, and she ended up supporting the family with it. She wrote two books, she had a newspaper column, she wrote these little things called star scrolls that, that were in the uh, markets, you know, next to the cash registers. And she did a lot of one-on-one -on -one readings and got very good at those. She was booked all the time. She's, and that's how she supported the family because dad was kind of, how do I describe him? He was lost and gave up on himself, drank a lot. And so she took over and took care of us and made the money and did a lot. And you mentioned a brother that you, so you have a biological brother too? And I have an older sisters. brother, Elliot, from my mother's first marriage. So they were both married prior to meeting each other. So she had Elliot and my brother, Michael, who died. He was 12 and I was three. And, excuse me, and then dad had three girls, two twins, identical twins and an older, older. And were you close to all of your siblings? I was not close to my sisters at all. They, the parents really didn't like each other. So he had visitation for a while, but they were very, the, the girls were very mean to my mom. And I saw that. And finally, you know, she tried to be nice and she would try to, you know, she gave them food and, and but they were just so awful. I guess their mom, you know, just said, you know, she's, she's a homewrecker and you can't be with her and you can't talk to her. And so finally mom would just take me away when they came and we were separated as kids. I met my sister again. She came to a show here in town at the Universal Amphitheater. Came backstage and said she was probably, how old was I? I was in my 40s, so she was, she's about six years older than me, so late 40s and said, hi, I'm Sherry, I'm your sister. She had two teenage kids with her who I'd never met. And it expanded my family instantly. I reconnected with her, with her family, with my, her uh, identical twin sister, Lori, with my older sister, and we just, it was wonderful. It was great. That's really nice. Yeah. Um, and this is just something random. So your mom being, I am also really into astrology. Okay. So do you know like all of your signs? Like yeah. Your, okay, I'm gonna ask you that later. You don't have to say it on yeah, camera, sure. but yeah. I ask everyone. I know everyone's like ascendant and moon and sun sign. Um, yeah, I can tell you, I my ascendant's so Aquarius. Mm -hmm. I'm on the cusp of Gemini Cancer. She said, any, any, any time when you're five days before or after the cutoff date that they say, you're really on the cusp because no planets move that fast. Mm -hmm. She was not a psychic. She didn't believe in, in all that at the time. To her, it was numbers. And she read the numbers and she was very good at it. Uh, but she, so, so because I was born June 26th, it's, it's technically cancer, but she said, you're kind of both. And I am, I'm a very talkative cancer. Most cancers are not talkative, but I am. So Gemini cancer, um, ascendant Aquarius, what else? Moon Pisces. Yeah. I wouldn't have guessed that. I know. I can see the Gemini part though. Yeah. Cause when I saw you were cancer, I was like, she doesn't really act yeah. like a cancer. Three planets in Leo. Okay, there you go. There's the performer. Yeah. Two in Scorpio. What else do you want? Oh, Scorpio would be, well, we'll get to, we'll get to all that. Scorpio, okay. I kind of understand too. I yeah. can see it. Right. Yeah. This is so interesting. Okay. I don't know if anyone else is going to care about this, <laughs> but I <Really>? do. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, what kind of kid were you? Were you shy? Were you always kind of like extroverted? Uh, did you have a lot of friends? No, never had a lot of friends because we moved all the time. So it was constantly trying to get into the new group of kids and trying to make friends because it was always, always moving. Uh, so I disappeared into music and reading 
mainly, they were my friends growing up. By 12, we, we settled, well, more like 14. We settled in Santa Monica, so my teen years were better because I was in one place, so I could meet people and keep, get relationships going. Yeah. Um, and you said that music and, and reading yeah. were things that you enjoyed. Was creativity something that was encouraged in your household yes. by your parents? Yes. yes. The, Very much so. Well, the record store too. Right. Yeah, because my dad was an artist, I and mean, he was not only a painter, but he was a very good actor. Mm -hmm. If he had, you know, tried to do something, continue to do something with it, he was very good. And he was a musician as well, so. And mom always said, well, I, I'm not artistic, somebody has to be the audience. So I'm here to listen and encourage you guys. And she did. <laughs> That's funny. Astrology is artistic and creative. It is, but not, it wasn't to her. To her, it was a science. It was just numbers. Yeah. It was just, you know, planetary configurations and, and where they were and numerically how it all fit together. That's how she looked at it. Um, what, I was gonna, maybe you already answered this. What was your first exposure to music? Was it the record store or did your family like listen to music? They were very the musical. Yeah, we listened to the house in the house all the time. We listened to God, really everything. Louis Armstrong, uh, Sergio Mendes, Frank Sinatra. I'm thinking about what my parents liked. And then my brother was into music, played piano. So some of the newer music came in. We always had stuff on on the radio, and I remember. I remember learning how to sing harmonies in the car so I would be heard over the radio because I wanted to be heard. It was important to me to be, to be noticed. So if I sang the lead, I wouldn't be noticed because somebody was already singing the lead. So if I could come up with a harmony, then I would have my own place in the song and I could, could stand out. So that's how I taught myself in, oh. in the car. Did you play any instruments or was nope. singing your thing from day one? Singing was my thing from day one. I can pluck out melodies because I write melodies so I can pluck them out on a keyboard and kind of play with that that way, but I'm not good enough mm. to play anywhere in front of people. Yeah, it's okay. Um, Self-taught, did you ever have lessons or did it just come naturally to you? For singing? Yeah. I was self-taught until the first tour that Geffen put us on and we did four to five shows in a row because they wanted to save money. You know, they didn't, the longer you're out, the more you're spending. And I didn't realize how to do that. So I blew out my voice really fast. And when I came back from the, that tour, I got some help from a guy, Ron Anderson. He's a great vocal teacher. He taught maybe still teaches Bjork and Mary J. Blige and Scott Weiland and uh, he's an opera singer and I still use to this day what he taught me. He was so good at what he did and I didn't study with him that long, maybe six months, but he taught me how to sing and how to maintain my voice without straining it and to use it powerfully without uh, force. What kind of high school student were you like? Terrible. Were you, you were terrible. I mean, I got, I did the grades. I wasn't stupid, but I didn't like it. I wanted to work more than anything. So I ditched a lot. We went and played ping, uh, pinball a lot. I love pinball. So we would go in Santa Monica. I mean, it's a great place to ditch school. It was just Everything's there. It was, I mean, it was such a switch, you know, because from the valley, the valley was gangs and drugs and it was rough. And then coming over the hill to Santa Monica and going to schools like beach bunnies and surfers, like, woo, you know, hey, you know, so it was just a lot of that. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And so, yeah, we would, my best friend and I would ditch school all the time and go down. And I remember. There was a place, they don't have it anymore, called Sambo's. It was a chain. 
And we went in there and we would have, this was our breakfast, we would have a lemon meringue pie and an egg and smoked. I remember one time seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger in there because I guess Gold's Gym was near that area in Santa Monica. And so he would go in there and have breakfast and he was all buff and hot. Don't forget that. And so, yeah, we did a lot of that. And then, you know, the schools weren't now. I mean, if your kid, it's like all automated. And if your kid doesn't show up or there's a problem, you know, immediately as a parent, then it was like, they'd call once. Oh, okay. She's not here again. And mom would say, come on, Terry. And I was like, yeah, all right. And so I would go and I'd do it, but I just didn't, I didn't love it. So I took the, it wasn't a GED. It was called the California equivalency exam where you could take it and get out a year early. You could take it at 16. So I did that. I passed it. I got out at 16 and then I started working. I started working in television. Okay. Yeah. Cause you had said you didn't care about school and you wanted to work. Yeah. Had you already, um, been on TV or done some? No, I, I had been a figure skater from, let's see, when did I say from 11, to 13, no, 11 to 14, because that's why we moved to Santa Monica, because they had a better, they had a skating rink there with better teachers, better coaches, so, so we moved to Santa Monica. So it was 11 to 14, I was a competitive figure skater. Before that, I had done some just local play stuff at a playhouse for kids, and that was every weekend we did plays. Yeah, I just wanted to do stuff. Yeah. And my I parents had no were great idea. with that. Oh, about the skating? I'd never heard that before. Oh, yeah. yeah that's why my jaw just went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was not good, but I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, so your, your plans for yourself after high school was to just kind of like figure out how you could well, be during high school. So, so after the skating and we were in Santa Monica... Honestly, I was afraid of music. I loved it so much that I thought that those people couldn't be like me. I mean, they were amazing. They were, they were my gods, yeah. these people. So I, I was afraid to even sing around my family. They didn't even know I liked, they knew I liked music because I played it all the time, but I never really, you know, once I got old enough to care about how I looked, I never sang in front of them because what if they said I sucked? Then, then my life would be over. So I, I just basically, you know, hid away my, my practicing and doing it. And my mom, because of the Playhouse stuff when I was a kid, she had a friend who knew an agent. So I went in and the agent said, here, read this copy. So I read this, this commercial copy and she had this interesting reaction to it. And then she said, okay, read this. And it was like police story scene. So I read that. She signed me. And I was 14. And so, so then it was about mom taking me to um, interviews and auditions all the time, getting rejected all the time. I think my first actual job was a McDonald's commercial. I'm embarrassed to say because I am a vegan. So yeah, but it was for a new shake that they had. And I was in the family in this commercial and I loved this shake. So, and they, and they really only uh, hired me because I looked like the parents. The parents had the lines and I was just the kid going, yeah, great shake, you know. So that was my first job. And then, and then um, this lady actually started getting me some theatrical work where I did a police story. I did Lou Grant. And then this other agency that was actually a, not a commercial agent, they were like a really good agency. They saw me in something and they asked if I would, would like some theat real theatrical representations. I said, she's just a commercial agent. And I said, sure. So, so I did that, that with them. So I signed with them and she did commercial. And it just started all snowballing uh, in the TV and movie thing. Berlin was your first band ever? No, there was another, <laughs> there was another band called L.A. <laughs> 
I like city names. L.A., L.A., I mean, it wasn't really a band, but to me it was because I was singing in a band and it was great. It, they were basically covers of what was popular in L.A. at the time, which was Jackson Brown and Linda Ronstadt and Fleetwood Mac. And that's, you know, that was what was going on on the radio in the 70s. So that's what we did. And we played little dive bars in around, you know, I think my first place was in Oxnard. And, and I was so excited. I wasn't even supposed to be singing because I was underage. I was like 15 or something, but, but nobody said anything. So I sang. My mom came and, and this guy she was dating who was a piano player who became very important in my life because he came in after my father committed suicide. She, a couple years later, started dating Lanny. And to this day, I remember him saying to me after that little Oxnard gig, he said, you're not going to be an actress, you're going to be a singer. I mean, I just couldn't believe that was even possible, you know, that that could happen. But I still remember it because he was the first one to say that that was going to happen. Mm. Okay, so how did you transition from L.A. to, <laughs> to Berlin? Berlin, okay. which I, wasn't it like... Was it Berlin when you joined? Because I knew John, like John Crawford started it and it was called something different. It was Berlin first. when I joined. It was, okay. He was in another band called Fahrenheit 451 before Berlin, which was three guys. But then he started Berlin and he had Tony Childs, who later had, you know, was Grammy nominated. She had Peter Gabriel on her record and she was a great singer. And so he started with her. And then he, uh, he was looking for another singer because she wanted to leave. She wanted to do the solo. Thing. She wanted her own deal. She didn't want the Berlin thing. So, so I went and auditioned for that, and I had the guts to do it because I lost something so huge in television that I lost all my representation. It was, I lost everything. It was a show called Dallas, and it was a seven year contract. And I had been doing auditions long enough and did enough television work that a lot of uh, casting directors knew me. They knew my work. They knew I was. Well, somehow this casting director talked these producers into just hiring me without an audition. They, and, and they looked at my footage and they said, oh, yeah, this is it. So, so I went in and, and they said, it's a seven-year contract. It's a, you know, big series you know if so if it goes for seven years you're you're doing it and I was like looking at this like well I'm thinking I kind of want to try this music thing and this if I do this there's not going to be any time for the music thing it's not going to happen at all and so I went home and my agents are like so excited They're like whoa you know what I mean it's like stupid amount of money just unbelievable great contract you know it was for the, did you, did you see the show? When you oh, were I know Dallas. Oh, okay, so Charlene <laughs> like Tilton. It's that role that she took eventually, the, 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 the teenage kid in the, in the show. So, so I went to her mom, I said, Mom, I, I really want to try this music thing, and I'm just afraid if I do this, it might be successful, which it was, and then I'm not going to get to do the music thing, and, and what do you think? And she said, Terry, if you know, if you don't try the music thing, you're always going to regret it because it seems like that's where your heart is. So, I would just say no and go try the music thing. But you should probably try it now. So I told the agents no, and they lost their shit. They were like, "Are you out of your fucking mind? This? Do you know how often this comes ever to anybody? Never." And, you know, they see all this money, like, disappearing from their lives. Drop me instantly. The agent was done with me. The manager's like, why waste time with you? I had nothing. I was alone. So I had nothing to lose. And so I started meeting people and, you know, trying it out with different, with different bands. There was only one other band that I really wanted, and I didn't get them. And then I gave myself a year. I thought, okay, if I don't get anything happening in a year, then I'll just, you know, I, I had to make money. I was 
18 at that point. And I, I was out of the house. I had my own apartment. I had to work. So I thought, all right, if that doesn't work, then I'll just try to get another agent and try some more TV stuff. And it was a year to the day that, that I made that decision that I met John. Okay. And his band really stood out to me for so many reasons because the music was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Nobody was doing it. I love things that nobody's doing. I love originality. I love unique. And he was doing stuff. He wasn't just talking. He was booking shows and he was in clubs. And, you know, they were struggling because they hadn't gotten anywhere yet, but they were doing things and they were trying and they were working. And they, it's like, okay, so, but they had that girl who was so good that scared the shit out of me. I thought, I'll never get this job. She was a great singer. And I had had one little shitty band, you know, LA. So I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, so I, I, sang my guts out, just, you know, tried as hard as I could. And, and the manager, Perry Watts Russell, came in to John and said, wow, you, you did it again. Because he thought Tony was great, and he said, you're never going to find another Tony. She was, she was great. But he said, you did it again. And, and so we started playing in the clubs in, in L.A., and it was a perfect time. This was... 1979 that I met him it was perfect because that's when you know the whole punk scene had exploded and it just opened up all these clubs were playing you know we wanted bands and it wasn't pay to play yet it was just they just wanted to get people in to drink you know they didn't pay us anything but they let us play so it was we just played two three shows every week we were writing, we were rehearsing all the time in Orange County because John was based in Orange County, so I'd drive back and forth. And just kept, that's how we started. How did um, Berlin like fit into the scene at Not the at time? All. Not at all. Not at okay, all. Was Nobody no was doing you? this. And so we were laughed at. It, at that point, it was punk and power pop. So it was the long skinny ties, like the plimsolls and... Uh, the Go-Go's, the uh, Bangles, Motels. I mean, these were, n nobody was doing electronic music and we, we weren't that good, so we were trying to get good. We wanted to be like Ultravox and Kraftwerk, but they were all overseas. There was not anything like that going on, so they were just like, where's your guitars? You know, they just didn't really get it. So. We kept at it, we kept getting better, and we kept playing and just slowly building a following. And some of the bands who were doing really well, like Oingo Boingo, Danny Elfman was great to us. You know, he heard some potential in us, so he would put us on his shows with Oingo Boingo because they had a following. Mm -hmm. So that helped, you know, just kind of people helping out people and getting, getting the word out. Yeah. But it didn't really, explode we actually broke up before it exploded because there was a guy who was funding our band from England and the rest of us didn't like him because he was too dominating and he was telling us what to wear and what to play and how to do it and a lot of us were like well we kind of want to do it this way but he was like well I'm the money so you're gonna do it my way and finally we had a showdown at a club one night and I, I had all the guys behind me. I was like, we're going to stand up to him, right? We're going to say, we don't like this and we're not doing this anymore and you can't tell us what to do or we're leaving. So that night I got up, it was before the show, and I said, Joe, we don't like this anymore. Right, guys? Yeah. So it's just me and Joe standing there, and Joe says, oh yeah, you don't like it? Fucking leave. Nobody said a word, nobody is with me. So I was like, all right, then I need to leave. So I walked out, and I didn't know that a German label had approached Berlin because of what they saw us do. Offered him a deal, 
like the next week. They had no singer. I was gone, so they scrambled, got a, got a girl, got a singer. They signed the deal and did the album. It went nowhere. You know, it just wasn't the same chemistry and they fell apart. And Joe took the advance money that they gave him, the German label gave Berlin, the guys, and went to England and started his own recording studio, which became very successful. But he just abandoned the rest of the guys, took the money, and left. So then there was nothing. So it was literally a year later that John called me by himself and said, you know, I really feel like we had something with you and I. And I'd like to just try to do some demos and see if we could shop them around. And I said, OK. And so we wrote Pleasure Victim and shopped it around. And the demos became the album. And to this day, it's our biggest selling album, those demos. Well, I do want to ask about the, is it pronounced us? It's not you, it's us festival, right? It's us not festival. like US festival right, or us. something. OK. Yeah. <sighs> Everything was amazing about it. OK, so, so it's 250,000 people. I've never, even in, since then, stood in front of 250,000 people. It doesn't happen because you usually have venues, you know, and it's contained somehow. But this was in dirt. It was just a few. Now it's the Hyundai Pavilion. It's now a, a venue. But, but then it was just space. And it was so many people that you could, they went over the horizon. Like I couldn't see the back of the people. And on that day, our day, just our day, it was a whole weekend. So it was three days of, of bands. But on our day, it was in no particular order, just as I remember, it was um, uh, Stephen Van Zandt, the Disciples of Soul, David Bowie, Stevie Nicks, U2, Pretenders, Joe Walsh, Quarter Flash. I, it was, it was like being like the ultimate fan and my dream of playing with these people in one day. It was just the greatest experience. And then to have Steve Wozniak, who funded this whole thing, lost $9 million doing it, didn't care. He said, I want a party and this is my party. Take my mom under his wing. Like she was there just so excited to be there and he gave her his pass. Like it had his name and it was all access so he could like go into your bathroom and have sex with you if he wanted to. He gives it to my mom. So she, cause he said, everybody knows who I am, you have. It. And so she could get anywhere she wanted to. He took her up in a helicopter, flying her around so she could see all this crazy Thing. My boyfriend's there. Richard Blade is there. The DJ is there. D is is announcing this thing. I it just to, you know you just have those moments in your life where no matter what you do, whether you're successful or not successful, those moments change everything. I mean, wow. It, it, there, it's just that was an event that will never happen again. It, it's it it, it 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 took a guy like him, Steve Wozniak, to be crazy enough to do it at all. And you know, so yeah, that that's that's something I remember on my deathbed because it was just such a gift to be a part of that. Yeah. One day I hope to spend nine million dollars and not care. And not care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard that That's about so Sting. Weird. I heard, you know, you probably know about that big, you know, brouhaha when, when his accountant was caught embezzling from him and he embezzled nine million and Sting didn't miss it. Didn't even notice. Didn't notice. It's fine. Everything's <laughs> gonna be fine. <laughs> Ever nice. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. So then what I try to do instead of doing, because it's like people can go on like Wikipedia and you can look at when your albums came out yep. and yep. what happened. Um, but if you could just elaborate or talk about like, you know, whatever is important to you 
If you could elaborate on Berlin's kind of trajectory to success after, because did it really happen mm -hmm. after you signed to Enigma? Um, like, was that when you started doing music videos and kind of like broadened yeah. your fan, fan base? Um, mm -hmm. We did our own videos because we believed in videos. It was so early days, MTV at that point hadn't started yet. It started the year that we signed with Geffen, but we did our own little videos anyway because we just thought it was such a cool addition to music. Anybody, Bowie had already started doing it, and you know some of the more progressive artists had, were doing it, and you saw him here and there. You know, you saw him on um, Midnight Special on Friday nights. You saw them on Don Don Kirshner's rock concert uh, on Saturday nights, and we just, you know lived for these things. So we we cobbled together whatever we could to make videos. And it's one of the reasons we signed with Geffen because he was one of the only people who believed in him. Even though MTV had started, it changed everything for us because. Some of the labels were like, no, you know, we're not giving you a video budget because they're never going to take off. And we're like, yeah, they are. We are. Everybody loves videos. And Gavin was like, yeah, we'll give you a video budget, which was great because MTV started. They had 24 hours to fill and no videos because none of the people were doing them. So our little videos, they played the shit out of them because they had all this time to fill. And no video, so that you know that took off for us. It got us in front of the country. If in the world, I don't think they'd started in yet, but in America, we got all this exposure over and over because just because Geffen had the foresight to believe in videos and to create them. So yeah, that and that was. I mean, Enigma was the start of everything because. They put out Pleasure Victim, and then K-Rock grabbed onto Sexima, and when they started playing that, everything changed. It was like, it exploded, because nobody had ever heard a song like that before. Nobody had ever written a song like that before. And so we got all kinds of reaction, and how can you write something like that? And all the kids wanted it. They all wanted to play it. All the parents didn't want them to listen to it. And so it was just this like, ah! So yeah, we sold 25,000 albums in a month. And then all the labels that we had approached before that told us to give up came back and said, no, we always loved you guys. So it was a different game. Um. Before Geffen, so like when you were a smaller, smaller band, yeah. or on Enigma, um, were you able to make a living as a band at that time, or did you all have to work other jobs, supplement your income? We all, yeah. all worked other jobs. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what were the band dynamics early on? Uh, I did read that you tried really hard to operate as a democracy we did. for a long time, but it like didn't. People say that all the time, that you can try to have everyone contribute, but it never works out and never goes well because, like it other never bands does, I've interviewed. It never does, because in a band, it slows everything down. I, I mean, maybe some bands work that way well, but you got to have somebody who's kind of the visionary who can oversee where it's going because if every, nobody has the same vision. So if you're having everybody having to agree, when is that going to happen? You know, it's really hard to do. So... Ultimately, Geffen was smart because they saw that that wasn't going to work. We were trying to make it work, but they, they signed John and me because we wrote the songs and we were the, the creative force behind the band. So to them, Berlin was John and me. So that's who they signed. And that's eventually kind of how it ended up being. Rather than democracy, we kind of ran everything. And John ran the business because I didn't know anything about the business and just thought, oh, the money's going to flow in forever. It's going to be wonderful. We're always going to be famous. It's going to be great. All that shit. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was your experience being on a major label 
when the music industry was kind of in its prime, when you had videos, mm -hmm. um, just what were some of the differences between being on a small label, being on a major label? The small label was more adventurous musically, I guess maybe because they didn't have as much to lose. And the bigger label, though I will say right out of the gate that David Geffen is amazing. He's, he's everything he says he will be. He kept his word. He gave us the longest contract offer. Where others offered more money, he offered more time. And we were at least smart enough to see that that was better because money will come and go. But commitment is what gave us a three record deal instead of two, where everybody else was offering a three record deal, gave us the commitment from the support from the label that allowed us to create an audience and a, a, a foundation under the band to have a career. That was great. That said, you know, they're a label and they want hits and they want money. That's why they're doing it. It's a business. So I get that. But that, so that constant push pull of you've got to be commercial and we're like, but we're electronic rock band and we want to do, you know, interesting things and we don't need to always be on the top of the charts. And they're like, yes, you do. <laughs> so, you know, there's just that constant, ah, you know. So it, it changes everything because you're no longer on the streets doing what you want and hoping you'll get somewhere. There's more mouths to feed now. And so there's more people with an opinion about what we're doing. So it, it changes the creative game of it and that said the collaborations that they brought to us were they didn't bring us Georgia Marauder but they made it happen I will okay I can't say they it was their idea to bring us Georgia Marauder but we loved him so much and we just thought what he had done with Bowie you know putting out fire with gasoline and Donna Summer and Blondie and Cat People and Flashdance and I mean the guy was just electronically doing everything we wanted to do and so we we were like we want to work with him please you know so they talked to him and he was so expensive at that point that all we got was one song with him but that exploded itself timing wise and it's all timing you know because we got that one song with him, while he was producing No More Words, he got Top Gun. He got the job to do the soundtrack for that movie, which was coming out the following year. So we were there. And we were nothing. We had not had a hit at all at that point. We were underground hit people, but nothing that the world knew or no chart positions whatsoever at that point. So he um, tried out a bunch of other people for that and because they were bigger and they had had hits and that's what Paramount wanted. They wanted a big singer to sing their big love song for this movie. So um, they tried out a bunch of people. They didn't like anybody. They didn't like any of the singers. So because we were there, he just said, well, I got this, I have this band. He's, he's uh, Italian. I have this band, and, and they're, they're going to be big. They're going to be so huge, and you, you must try them. You must, you must listen to them. Maybe this thing will be good for you. So they said, all right, well, we don't have anybody else. Go ahead. So I got the chance to audition and do the, the job. So I'm just bringing that up because I know that's in your future of your questions, but, but because the timing of everything, you know, and that all came from the label getting it to happen with Giorgio, the collaboration with him. Once you were signed to Geffen, like there are a lot of, like you just said, really good aspects of being on a major label, more opportunities. Yeah. Um, but the work schedule seems very intense and <laughs> grueling and maybe not necessarily like sustainable <laughs> a lot of the time. Right. Um, so yeah. what was your work schedule like? What was your tour schedule like? How often were you expected to, to tour or to record or to be? All the time. Constant? Forever. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not forever, for as long as the money kept flowing into them. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we, you and I, before we started the interview, were talking about ageism. And the reason, the only reason that there's ageism in music is because they can push around young people. They don't have families. They don't have brains yet. I didn't know what I was doing. I just wanted, I wanted to be a rock singer, you know? So, so it's easy to manipulate kids. It's not, and, I, and, the, and I'm not putting them down for it. It's a business. And, and I agreed to do it. But because I was a kid and had no family and nobody really looking out for me, they just, you know, make a record, get on tour, make a record, get on tour. I didn't have sex with anybody really and for four years. I was celibate. There was no time. There was no time to have a relationship. There was no time to be at home and have friends and, you know, it was just going, 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 going because to them, it's like this train is, is, is moving and you've got to do it now because we don't know when it's going to end and you don't either and, and we're not going to be there if it ends for you. So keep it going if you want your rock star life. So that was, that was the deal and, and, and it, it imploded the band eventually because we weren't smart enough to say no, we're going to take a break now. We're going to keep our sanity. We didn't keep our sanity. We just eventually turned on each other it, because we were so f f tired and alone and isolated and, you know, and I don't like people who say, oh, the big bad record label. It's just a business. That's, you know, that's what you're signing up for. And, and they're allowed to try and do that. But I wish that I, maybe I had known more or had more people in my corner to, so that we as a band could have balanced all of it, which is what's happening now, which is why I love it more now, because I can have a life and music isn't everything now. It's part of life. We didn't have that then. So anyway, that's the whole reason that, that, that record labels go after young kids. They're pretty and they're dumb and they'll do it. They'll do it for a while, you know, until they either kill themselves with drugs or go insane or they lose their audience, you know. So that's, that's the way that machine is built. It's not the only way, but it's, it's the way that the big machine is built. So. Yep. I was telling a friend <laughs> the other day, I was like, I think I'm ageist, but in the opposite way that people, no, seriously, it's a problem. Like I, I have to. You think kids are just. I think, I, don't understand what, <laughs> what like the things that are popular nowadays and younger artists, like we we do a lot of filming, so we film every pretty much everyone live that okay. we've interviewed so far, and so it's you know I was thinking who I've seen this year, and I'm like, just saw L7 again. It was like one of the best rock shows I've ever seen in my life. Still, and they're in their 50s now, and it like means wow. so much more to me now that I'm, you know pushing 40, it's just like there, there's like substance and history and it's like you look, not only do you look cool, but like you are cool. <laughs> and I'll see opening bands and my friends make fun of me because I'm just like, oh, I'm so bored right now. It'll be like some young new hip band or something like opening <laughs> for the band yeah. that I want to see. Yeah. So I'm trying to yeah. um, broaden my horizons and be more open-minded about that young people can be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm usually just like, so you're prejudiced. I'm prejudiced against. In that way. Yeah, people under the age of 30. Okay. And I'm trying, <laughs> yeah. I'm That's trying great. really hard. Under the age of 30. That's yeah, great. under 30, yeah. Wow. I only care about people, artists and musicians over 40. Well, much. you know, I mean, but, but you and I know, you don't have kids. I do, so I'm forced to listen to everything. My daughter's 13, and, yeah. and she wants to hear, you know, Katy Perry and, you know, all these girls, you know. And, 
And some of I like, Rihanna, I think she's great. I think she's a great artist. That said, you know, yeah, they don't speak to me. You know, it, they're as deep as a puddle, but that's where Natalie is. And that they speak to her because that's what she wants to talk about. Puddle deep, you know, that because that, so you and I want to listen to L7 or, or U2 or, or, or the pretender, or, you know, bands that are talking about stuff we're interested in now because we're way past fucking in the back seat, okay? That's where they, that's where she wants to be and that's where we were in our 20s. So it's all music for different ages, you know? Yeah, that's true. All right, thanks, Terry. That, <laughs> Does that help? Yeah. No, I feel like a real jerk most of the time. I'm just like, I can't. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so you're talking about the how often you had to work in your schedule. So I usually yeah. ask um, people that I'm interviewing about that, that kind of lifestyle and difficulty, if there is any difficulty in maintaining like personal relationships or, um, but you <laughs> dated the John Crawford for, I didn't, okay, I, didn't I did date, not. Never dated John Crawford. Wait, what? Never. No. You no, were together the, as a couple? Never. As a romantic couple yes. or as, as a business couple? As a romantic couple. Never. Never. No. Never even had a little liaison in there. One time he, he rubbed my feet. That felt good. Oh, all right. So yeah, he kind of gave me a massage like, after one show. And I was like, oh, that's really good. I mean, we'd been on the road for weeks, and I was just horny and lonely and, you know, <laughs> as usual. And so, yeah, he was rubbing my hands. I was like, oh, God. And, and I just looked at him and I was like, no, we can't do this. Because we knew if we did something like that, the whole thing would, ex would implode and fall apart. And so we, we didn't go there. So we were in the videos as romantic. Yeah. But that's just because he looked good and we it was an obvious choice for the sex I'm a video or for no more work. You know, he was, he, it was a perfect couple thing, but okay. we never were romantic. So did you have, uh, because you had said in other interviews that it was really hard to maintain friendships with your work schedule and working all the time. Were you able, did you have any relationships? Did you, um, I wasn't good at it. Yeah. Yeah, I was really stupid. I thought that if I was successful, that everything else would fall into place, that I would have great relationships. I just kind of tied everything in with success, that if I was good at what I did at my job, that everything else would be amazing. Not at all. I mean, it's completely different subjects, you know. And I would just cry with my mom, like, well, you know, why is my love life so messed up and but I'm, I'm doing well musically and aren't, you know, and it just never, it's two completely different wheelhouses, you know? And we have to learn how to be in a relationship. We have to learn how to be in a band. We have to learn all these different specialties in life, how to be a parent, you know, it was terrible, you know, just so, yeah, it, it took, it took, the band falling apart, well, I left the band in 87, so it took the band falling apart and me, you know, having nothing again to learn how to be in a relationship. And I got married and I met my first husband, Mark, in 87 I left, so I met him 91, 90 or 91, wait, 91. Yeah, 91. And yeah, and then got married and learned how to have a relationship, you know, because it wasn't all Berlin all the time, all music all the time. So yeah, I mean, relationships need time and attention and I didn't have that. <laughs> I didn't give that. Who's going to stick around? Even if they love your celebrity, if you're not there, you know, it's, nothing can can last and sustain because people need attention and love and I know it's so annoying <laughs> <laughs> yeah you seem very similar to me like you love to work and yeah that's your wheelhouse that's what you can't you came in with that skill and that talent and you came here to learn about relationships that's what I feel for me 
I'm good at working. I like it. It's, you know, I've learned a lot. Of course, I'm, you know, didn't come in a great musician, but, but I, I, I just kind of fell like a duck to water, but relationships, how do you do that? You know, it's, it's, it's something I came here to learn. Take my breath away. Um, that, is that what ultimately led to the band's demise with that song? It hastened it. Okay. It was both the blessing and the curse of the band because it, it was our first number one. It was our first international number one. And so we got to play everywhere for the first time that we had not before, but it also like complete, because, you know, success heightens everything. It heightens it, everybody, everything in a, in, a, in a personality will get more with success. So everything that was bad got way worse because now we're working even more than before. So we have even less of a life if we had any before. Now the label's like, oh, you're going to play everywhere. You're going to, you know, so it's like there's no time for anything but this. And so the money was bigger, but so was the work and so everything just and we're, and we're tired and we're just and we don't know what to do about it and we don't know how to talk to each other and that got worse so by the end of that tour it we weren't even speaking john and 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 i weren't even talking anymore we just couldn't couldn't figure out anything that we agreed on we should have just taken a year off and come back to it and just said, fuck you to the label and get another one if we could. And just because we would have been together earlier, you know, we're back together now. Right. So, so that's, but this is how many years later that, <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, that, that was the nails in the coffin. Ultimately take my breath away. Yeah. And didn't they, the rest of the band was kind of unhappy because they didn't write the song or something? It was like... Yeah, they didn't want to do they it. it. They, yeah, John didn't want to do the song. And, and I thought it was great. I would, I, Georgia Marauder could have farted and I would have sung it. I loved that guy so much. And so when he came in and said he wrote a song and would you like to sing it, I, I didn't even need to hear it. I was like, yeah, give it to me. I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll sing it to you tomorrow. And John's like, no, that's not our music. We're not doing that. We need to be Berlin. This is not Berlin. This is Georgia Murder. I said, I don't care. I, I want to do it. So, and the label's like, do it, do it, do it. You know, it's a big movie. And, and so they're all over it. So they shut John down and yeah. we did it. Um. And when the, so when you finally disbanded and called it quits, you were like 26 or 27 at the time, right? Yeah. Still really see, young. Yeah. 87 I left or 86? It's right in there somewhere. Yeah. 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 26. Um, was there any, <laughs> did you experience any kind of like terror of... <laughs> <laughs> What do I do now? No, Did you have a plan? I mean, because the label kept me on okay. as a solo artist. So I thought, okay, you know, I didn't realize, you know, that things can fall apart because <laughs> they hadn't fallen apart yet. <laughs> so it's like, oh, yeah. Woo. So I went and did the solo record, which was a disaster. It was awful. It was a terrible record. Because I thought my, my big great idea was, well, I'm going to do everything I'm going to do. I'm going to do rap, I'm going to do dance, I'm going to do country, I'm going to do ballads. It's just going to be everything. So when it came out, people were like, what is she? You know, nobody could figure out what I wanted to be because in music, you, you know, I don't know, I just thought they would love me and that, that they would follow whatever I did. And if I did ever, because I had been just doing electronic music for how many years at that point? So I thought... I was like a like let out of a cage. It's like, okay, I want to do everything. I want to do blues. I want to do rock. It's gonna be everything. It's all on be fabulous. one album. Everything all <laughs> on one album. It was a mess. It was horrible. It was just it was bad. It was terrible. So, What's nice about that album is that even the negative re reviews, people are still really nice about you. It's like Terry Nunn is great. What a beautiful <laughs> voice. 
could, like could have more direction or something. It's not even nothing's really mean. Like it seems like everyone still loves you. Yeah, but well, just like I don't know. What's not going enough on. to buy the record. So yeah, <laughs> Geffen was like, Pfft. that was Aww. the end of Geffen. So they left. Yeah. So then that's when everything fell apart. Then it was like, oh shit. Well, I got to have a life. I got to have a marriage and see what that was like and work on that. But then I had no, no job. <laughs> so then I was fighting my way back to, to um, making money again. Doing it was, wow. Yeah, so then that took a while. Because I didn't, I didn't start the band again until 98. But that's when my marriage was falling apart. Because he was like, I wasn't making any money. And he was, this isn't what I signed up for. And he also didn't like the, the music lifestyle at all. He thought, on paper, oh yeah, wow, I'll be married to a famous person, this will be fun. But I was never home. You know, I was trying to make something happen. He's like, why can't you be home? Why can't you just be a songwriter and, and make me dinner at night? Because he wanted to be the alpha alpha male he wanted to make the money and he eventually did make money and there's a lot of women who would have who like that you know they they don't want to go out and do a career they want to stay home have kids and cook and that's great you know that's a job too and it's a full-time job but i that wasn't me so we started falling apart and he wasn't happy at all and i wasn't happy at all so right when berlin started taking off again is when we broke up and then I met my husband now. We've been, we just, we're cel celebrating our 20 year anniversary this year. Oh, congratulations. You. So you obtained the rights to the name Berlin. Berlin yeah. in the mid 90s? Late 90s. Late 90s? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then that caused a lot of tension with John. Yeah, it right? split us up. Because um, he had of, owned the name the whole time. Yeah. He owned Berlin as a trademark, but he let it lapse because he wasn't doing it either. Mm -hmm. He had gotten married. His wife said that, you know, he did it for his ego and he should not be writing anymore and he should, you know, be an upstanding guy. And so he, he got a job doing Mad Science. It's a, how do I describe it? It's a franchise where they bring science projects into schools. So kids, like extracurricular yeah. school stuff. So he was doing that. And so the Berlin name just lapsed. So when he and I started trying to work together in the late 90s again, nothing was happening. And it wasn't the magic at that point. And my manager at the time said, well, Maybe, is, why don't you just go out and start playing again? Is the, is the name available? And so I checked, and it was. And John had decided at that point that maybe he could just get another singer. And my manager said, buy the name. Then he can't get another singer. And so I did. And when John found, when he found out, he was livid. He was so mad at me. So we didn't speak for seven years until the VH1 show. Was that actually as organic as it appeared? Did you It know was, that they were but it wasn't as organic on camera. Okay. It was because when when they said to me off camera before they actually showed up at my house, which I knew they would, it looked like I didn't, but at that point I knew because I had to know, I had to be home. Mm -hmm. But they said to me before the show, they said, do you think John will be part of this? I said, no, because he wasn't in music, he was mad at me, you know, I know it was seven years. And at that point I really missed him. It, you know, when, when you have a 13 year relationship with someone, and, and the music that he wrote to this day, you know, helps my kids' college education. It gave me a platform to continue. Mm -hmm. There was so much that, that he gave me and that we weren't speaking was just awful to me and I didn't know how to fix it. 
So then VH1 came along and said, well, we were doing this show. Do you think he'll be part of it? And I was like, no, probably not. But then he was. That was what brought us together again as friends. That show re-solidified our friendship and gave us a chance to, for me to hug him and thank him for what he had given me in my life and, and tell him how sad I was that, because at that point he was over the name. You know, he realized he didn't want to do it and he was holding on to it for nothing, for no reason, and saw what, what had happened with Berlin and where, where I'd taken it in that seven years. And because of where I'd taken it, he was making more money because the catalog was selling again because of, you know, what I had done with the name. So, so we were all good, you know, as far as history with each other. And it was just great to be able to talk and be friends again yeah. after all that time. That's the only episode of that show that I remember. Wow. I watched all of them. Yeah. But the Berlin one was the only one that I cared about. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. And you can watch it on YouTube because I was like, I need to really? watch this again. Yeah, it's up there in, in it, its entirety. I so remember... <laughs> I remember the Frankie Goes to Hollywood one because we toured with them. We opened for them. It was our first major uh, arena tour in Europe because we had never been there and they were massive. They were playing hockey stadiums. And so we got an opening slot with them and it was awful. They were, not the shows, but they as a band were completely falling apart. They were, the, the uh, Holly Johnson was, didn't like the band and they were in separate buses and they were drinking. I mean, they drank us, on, drank us under the table every night and he was not speaking to anybody and it, ugh, it was just horrible. So I watched that to see if possibly they would get back together. But you know. They didn't? No. Did you see that one? No, I no. didn't see that one. No. I'll watch I think it now. he said he would show up. He had a boyfriend at the time. He was his manager and said he would and sort of was like, maybe. And then at the end, he didn't show up. I know. Sad. Because that would be great. They were a good band. Um, well, out, outside of music, you've hosted a podcast or a webcast. You had a radio show. Mm -hmm. um, where the, was, I'm just always interested when people kind of like, people who I know as musicians and performers, like end up doing other things. It's like, how did you end up... <laughs> Doing, doing a webcast and a radio show, was it something you always wanted to try? Yeah. Yeah? And then Both. you just did it? I always, told, told, I always felt that if I wasn't good at music, that I would want to be a DJ because then I could play other people's music that I liked because I just loved music. And I didn't know if I was talented or if I could make a living at it and eat. So I thought, okay, so if that doesn't work, then I'll be a DJ. So I've always thought, oh, wouldn't it be great to have my own DJ show? I could play all the music I wanted, anything. So that's how that happened. This station, KCSN in Los Angeles out of Cal State Northridge has um, a program where they wanted an electronic dance EDM type show on Saturday nights for two hours. And how did he approach me? The, the program director Somebody, I think, said to him, what, what would you think about Terry Nunn being a host for one of your shows? And he said, I would love it. So they hooked us up, and we had a meeting, and he gave me the job to host the, the radio show. I was hoping, it worked out great, and I'll get to that, but I was hoping that I could do what you do. I love interviewing people. Love it. As you know, I interviewed Grace Slick for the podcast. A number of people for the podcast. And I, I'm fascinated with, I love it. I love trying to ask the right questions, you know, making a safe space for them to be truthful and feel okay about telling their truths in their life. And because it's so interesting to me to f hear how they did what they did and, and what happened and how how'd they fuck up and how'd they get through it and you know all that's fascinating to me so I was hoping the radio show would I'd be able to bring in people and interview them so I was trying to make it something else 
as well as the music, and he would have none of it. He's just like, we're not, this is not a talk show. It's not a talk station. People don't listen to the station to hear you interview anybody. They want music. And so it's like, okay. And it was great anyway, because I was writing Animal at the time. And that radio show I did for two years, every Saturday night, they allowed me to play whatever I wanted. And I immersed myself in electronic EDM, everything that was going on in electronic music to play for my show. And it was, I was so inspired by what I was hearing and what was going on. And it gave me a direction for Animal that I needed. And so when, then when Animal came out, it was the end of the radio show because I had to tour the album and there was no time. You know, it takes time to program even two hours in a week of a radio show and then do it. So uh, I had to let that go, but it was perfect timing for, for the album. It was like a, a history lesson. It was like just getting, immersing myself in, in the music and in people to work with, which was great for that album. So it was perfect, perfect timing. But the podcast was interviewing. You know, we got to interview a lot of people for that. And, and I, absolutely loved it but it was a podcast they were never you know you have to really work for years on a podcast to get any money to get you know like Mark Marin, who I listen to religiously I just love his show and love how he interviews and that he he's just got such a great style and he asks deep questions and he's funny and that's the kind of show I would love to have someday but he's been working on that for Years, you know, and he's finally got, you know, sponsorship and great. Now everybody from the president on, you know, goes on his show, which is so great. But it took him a long time to do that. And I got this other business, another career that I wanted, you know, music I still love. So I don't have the time to give it, but I admire people who do that. I had to just film like a five second thing for a crowdfunding video. And it's, Terrible. That's being a, an announcer. I think I'm too reserved. I don't think I could ever. There's a lot. Like you can't. Don't you feel like you can't be self-conscious at all, like to be an actor? Well, it's the ultimate dichotomy, isn't it? Because you, yes. you are being watched the whole time. You know you are. You have to know you are, to yeah. know how to work the camera and play with it, so that you know how to convey what you need to convey, whatever emotion it is. And it, that's, that was great for me too, because it taught me how to, it has to be honest emotion, it has to be felt honestly to work as an actor. And it taught me to do it on command in a small amount of time, because music, a song's even smaller. That's only like three minutes. A scene can be anything. But a song, I have to bring it right then, that emotion, honestly, powerfully, right then in that three minutes or it doesn't work at all. It's not real, it's not truthful. So that was a great discipline to teach me how to be a singer, to teach me how to, because all singing is, is con it's communication. That's all it is when it's honest. There's technique to it, but it's just communicating ideas and emotion. That's all it is, honestly. In either writing it or, or singing it or playing it. That's all it is. And, and if it can, and it, it sounds easy, but you know, it's, it's, just, it's a craft too. That's the thing, it does sound easy. And it's not at all. It's not, yeah. cause some nights I don't feel like singing fucking no more words again, you know, oh, but, no. but they are there to hear it and they want it. And that's why they bought the ticket. And so I've got to be there and be as, as real as, as I can be in that three minutes for them that night because that's what I'm there to do. And, and it is an honest emotion or I wouldn't have sung it. But, but you know, you know, you just sometimes you just don't want to go to work. You don't want to do the job that night. You don't want to sing Take My Breath Away again. You're not feeling it, you know, but you got to feel it. You got to because that's the job. Um, I have the question that goes back to your Scorpio signs. Okay. Um, so what? your hair is perfect, by the way. Is I, I'm right just now, I cannot no. believe your hair. It's just you guys got that right. Absolutely okay. amazing. I'm gonna post that on my Instagram. It's fantastic. <laughs> it just it you're like a commercial. You're like a hair oh, commercial. 
You, are you walk around that's like this the all the time, or thing anyone's this... ever said to me? <laughs> is this like you always that. like this? It's or you do always, really did it special course, today? No, I don't do any. If I do anything to it, it's out of control. It. This I is what you no, wake up like, Terry. It depends on the weather. When it's humid, this is like it's a it's slightly humid today. So I went. Oh, I don't know what's gonna happen. Not really. By the time. It's dry in LA. That's yeah. that's nice. Yeah, I mean I that's kinda, one of the the nice things. It's hot as shit. Where but it's I live, dry. it's very humid. So okay. I my hair will look like this, and then I'll step outside, get into my car, and then I look at what happened in with you know the thirty seconds that I was outside. So it gets all it's frizzy huge. and awful. Yeah, you mine gets this. frizzy and awful. Yeah, too. it really just depends on the weather. And okay. today's a good day. So thanks. You can have some of it if you want. I'd give you some I've of my hair. I've bought quite a bit of it. I, yeah, I've got some black in here. Yeah, yeah. I bought a lot. Um, so, okay, Scorpio. The Scorpio question. Yes. So sex, sexuality has mm -hmm. always been just, like since the beginning, a huge part of your, um, of Berlin's kind of repertoire mm -hmm. and your performance. And I remember when Animal came out and I was like, oh my God, she's still doing the same thing. And I was like really excited about it. Mm -hmm. how, how much of that is, is you as a person? Like, are you just a sexual person, not afraid of expressing that part of yourself? And how, how much of it is like a persona or part of the kind of Berlin, the band? There's two reasons that I go back to that subject one well in the beginning we were 20 and that's all we thought about anyway you know what else was there what else mattered sex and money that's all that that mattered to a 20 year old me so yeah that was that was how deep I was then but it was also I grew up in a household where sexuality was openly talked about not in a like creepy way just it was it was considered a gift to us as humans it was not regulated as a religious thing or you only you know it was it was it was how do I even describe how my parents were about it it they considered it a gift we're given and we are we're born sexual and this is not something to control like religion does, to be afraid of, to uh, suppress. It is, it's like one of the things that we're here to enjoy. And it didn't, they weren't like, well, just have sex with everybody you want. They, they believed in safety but I, I, to this day, love their philosophy and want, wanted to share it with the world, share freely the fun of sexuality, the power of sexuality, the gift of sexuality in music, because that's how I communicate. And the fun thing about it is, even now, I mean, there's a song on the new album, which I think will be called Transcendence, but it's about how my sexuality feels to me now. Because I'm almost 60 years old. And it, as you know, as a woman over 25, you know that it shifts and changes. And it's like fun in a new way now. And then it gets fun in a new way later. And, it, and there's... It's like this whole like journey through life. It's not just a fixed sexuality that, yeah, you have sex and you come and then you go, you know, have a sandwich. It changes. It, it has like all different kinds of levels and ways to play. And there's just a whole new, it's a new freedom in my sexuality that I never had before because now the kids are grown. Before, I had this kind of like, my sexuality was attached to, well, does he like me? And is he, are we going to go steady? And are we going to get married? And are we going to be together forever? And is he having sex with anybody else? And, you know, and it's like I had to, like, it had to be a sexuality that was exclusive. And, and I get that. 
because as women, we need to have children and we need a partner to do that. Ideally, it helps because it's a lot of work. So it's, it's, a, it's a species thing. I get it. But now there's like, that's all lifted. It's a different sexuality now that's really fun. And I don't have that, I don't have that need for it to be forever. I don't need the ring. I, don't, I have the ring because I love my man, but I don't need that now for it to mean something. I don't need the sex to mean anything. It's almost like the chorus of I want you is, what if I could love you like a man? What if I could just let go and dance? What if I could walk away just friends? It's a completely new level of it that I really like because I used to judge men. I used to think, well, why aren't, why, you know, they're, they're so frivolous and they just have sex for fun and that's not right. That, they can't do that. That's not good. Well, why not? Yeah, maybe it is fun and good. And what's wrong with that? And so I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because I'm telling you my trajectory sexually and sharing that. That's why I wrote Animal at, how old was I? I wrote that in... 2012, so I was, I don't know, early 50s. So that was a, you know, a whole different level of sexuality at that point. And now there's I Want You on this album, and there was Sex Ima when I was 23 or whenever I wrote that. It's all like, it's not all I write about anymore, but, but it's a powerful part of our existence, and it's fun to to share freely what my journey is with it and, and have the platform to do it. I'm really lucky. That was Thanks, very Terry. long-winded. Yeah, no, it was good. It wasn't <laughs> what I was expecting. It was just like, wow. Um, okay, so we're, we're almost done. Um, yeah, I do want to know, I don't know if you had to do any convincing this time, but you are playing, recording, and touring with the original members again, right? How the hell did that happen? <laughs> I know! <laughs> Blindsided me. Yeah. I had no idea this was coming. It's actually the original guys and some of the new, so it's like a bigger Berlin. It's like a, a past and future melded together on stage. It happened out of nowhere because John is getting a divorce and two years ago he came to me and he was devastated. He's been with this woman for over 20 years, had three kids with her. They're gro all grown except for one. One is still in the house. And he's, you know, he knew I had, I had been through a divorce. And so he came to me and said, what do I do? And, and so we, really got close again th through that. And then David Diamond also, uh, he was reaching out to. And then at the same time, David Diamond's relationship of eight years, a guy that he had bought a house with, he, dis he left him. So they're both going through the divorce kind of phase in their lives. And it's hard. It's awful. It's, you know, even if it's amicable, it's awful because everything's changing. And we, as a trio, we are the original trio on Pleasure Victim. We just kind of held each other and then we're with each other a lot. And we, so we just started playing with musical ideas because that's what we do. And John's like a, a, out, let, let out of a cage because his ex didn't want him to do music at all. And the guy is, you know, for this new album, he wrote 40 songs. And as we got the record deal and, and we're working on the songs and trying to pick 12 to do, and he's coming in with more. And we're like, no, you know, we don't barely, we can't even figure out what to do out of these 40. But, but I've got these new ideas. No, we don't want any more ideas. He's just like a bat out of hell. He's just like, like a, out of a cage. So it, it just mushroomed in a way that none of us expected to happen. Yeah. I'm excited. So you're touring everywhere, right? Yeah. Go. Okay. Yeah. 
East Coast. Yeah. All right, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Um, and you touched on this, so just if there's anything else that you want to add to it, um, but what are some major differences you've noticed in yourself and I guess in, in your bandmates as uh, people who have been performing and in the public eye for you know 40 something years? Um, yeah, just what are some differences that you notice in yourself now as a musician, as a performer versus when you were in your 20s doing it? I'm like, better. better? Yeah. <laughs> and I enjoy it more now. That's a great thing about getting older that I really like is, I, is life's more fun. Because something about the, both the, the wisdom of knowing that I don't need to stress out all the time because everything does work out, knowing what to stress out about, what not to stress out about. It is true. I've read studies that people do get happier as we get older, and it's, it's happening. And I really like that because... I'm enjoying what I'm doing more and living in the moment of it more than I ever used to. And, and getting the, the opportunity to keep making music and enjoy it more is such a gift for me. I, I just read this book, I don't know if you've read it, called Big Magic. It was written by the lady who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And it's really written for creative people of all kinds, writers, musicians, actors, you know, all kinds of artists. And she, she brought up something that resonated so much with me because she said, I've been through so many different aspects of my career. She said, why do, we, why do people say that it's when you make the most money that's the best time of your career? when you're at the height of your money making, you know, the charts or the height of the, you know, your, your movie's the biggest or your book is on the New York bestseller list. Why is that the best time? Because you made the most money. Why is that considered the best? And it, I have to agree with that because I made the most money, but that wasn't the best time. Emotionally, I was... Not a wreck, but I was scared all the time. I was scared I wasn't going to keep it. I was scared I wasn't good enough. I was scared they were going to find me out. I was, I had no love in my life. I mean, it, you know, that part was good, but now, you know, it, it just, as it's grown, I, I've made money and been able to save enough, you know, been able to eat and save enough and have a family. And now I have love and I have a family and I have friends and I have music and, and it's just like I would never go back to the top of the charts if it meant that that I would lose all this no way this is unbelievable because it's balance that's what's better is giving myself the balance in life so I can have more of the different great things that life has to offer not just music, not just money. That's what's, what's better about it for me is, is having, having it all. That's a good answer too. They're all so good. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So I have three questions at the end that I ask everyone at the end of every interview. Okay. They're like a little gendered. I hope it doesn't feel like I'm like forcing you to answer a question a certain way. That's I would feel bad. Um, so I'm not. But what are your, <laughs> just know that I'm not. Um, what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? Um, is there a gender discrepancy? Is it not really an issue? Or is it something that's changed for better or, or worse? Oh, it definitely started? has changed for better. Yeah, there's a lot of female musicians now and so much more acceptance of, of women in, especially popular music, you know, in opera, we've always had women singers. And, 
but but especially in rock because it started with guys it started as a you know male dominated musical form and we kind of got in there because we liked it and i you know that's great and and it and it's just grown exponentially since then so it's definitely gotten better yeah oh i did forget this one who are some of your major musical influences just like who do you love then currently i don't care well grace lick yeah she was she was the first for me i don't know if i was five or six or something but watching her she i just saw her on some tv show on our you know black and white tv in the 60s and and she was just fuck you you know i remember this, oh, they were all up in arms but she was just like a guy she was like she had all everything the guys had but she was a girl and i was like that's what I want to do. I want to be like that. But there weren't that many of that at that point. So she was it. And then Ann Wilson from Heart was another one. Wow, that blew my mind. Stevie Nicks blew my mind. I remember pulling over. I, I remember hearing Rhiannon on the, on the radio. I was in the car. And I pulled over. And thought, Who the fuck is that? And going to the record store. Remember record stores? And asking, you know, they said Fleetwood Mac. I said, okay, I want the girl in the Fleetwood Mac. Uh, does she have a record? And, and they gave me a Christine McVie record. And I took it home. And I like Christine McVie. She's a great writer. But no, that's, <laughs> that's not it. And so I went back. And then they gave me Buckingham Nicks. Because there's that record. And I wore it out. I just thought she was just just amazing, just unique. Nobody sounded like her. She was beautiful. She was writing and everything I wanted to do. So, yeah. Um, so, those were, and then, of course, you know, those are, um, if, did you want only women? Oh, no, whoever. Oh, yeah. okay. Bowie. Yeah. Bowie. Bowie, I always credit as being the reason we happened even before punk. Because without Bowie, there wouldn't have been glam rock. Bowie made it possible for Elton John, for, for Queen to happen, for all of glam rock to happen. New York Dolls, that all became from Bowie. And without glam rock, there would have been no new wave because we were spawned from, from them. So Bowie was the granddaddy to me of all of that. And he... He was, he was amazing. And then for me personally, Michael Hutchins from In Excess was just so pivotal to me watching him perform. We ended up dating for a minute um, when they came to, uh, to England. We were doing an album there and so we met them because we were label mates so they our label said you want to go see this new band they're playing at a club here in London and you know you're not doing anything so we went to sleep. oh my god I mean he was I think he was Jim Morrison back in the flesh because he was everything that that I had heard Jim Morrison was and and seeing him and just seeing how he let go into the music and 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 let his sexuality and his body and everything become the music was like okay that's it that's what i want that's what i aspire to musically is just to lose myself in the music and just be a conduit for people of the message and the music itself that's what we're all there for it's not about me it's not it's it's about the music and it's about all enjoying it together and that's what I got from him and that's that was a major influence for me was him and <sighs> Van Halen singer right now is, is it's because I'm older that sometimes names just fly out of my head um, Wait, which one? the first one David Lee he also because we saw him when they were playing the clubs before they became stadium players. And, and watching him, it was the same thing. He 
he treated the room like not only his best friends, but like it was a stadium. And just the friendliness and the, the openness and the sharing of the music was pivotal to me in, in how to be with people. Pink Floyd. Yeah. We were lucky enough on the sec third album, to, Bob Ezrin came in and saved it because we had done this horrible bunch of songs in England. They were just god awful. And, and the label said, okay, we're going to bring in somebody else to fix this. So we got Bob Ezra, and he was the producer of The Wall. And because he was producing it, he asked David Gilmore to come in and, and play on one of my songs on the album. And that is one of the highlights of my entire life. He came in and he played, he's my favorite guitarist of all time. He came in and played 20 minutes. And the way Bob would produce it is he would just take, like for the wall or anything, he would just take the loop, the part of the solo that he wanted David to do and just say, go. And David played nothing the same for 20 minutes. He would, was just speaking through his instrument. And I was just like, I will marry you. I will have your children. You can shoot me in the face. Just don't stop playing, please, God. I have never felt this way about anybody in my life. It was, it was, and we just saw him. They just played again just in town. Uh, just David um, played again at, at, a, a, at the forum here. And, and it, transcendent is all I can say. Just, so Pink Floyd. Yeah. To this day, they don't sound old. Their albums don't age because they don't sound like anything else. They never did then. So it never gets old. It's just its own thing. And that's why I love unique music because it never ages. It doesn't, it can't, it can't be placed anyway because it doesn't, never sounded like anybody in its own time. So it, it doesn't age either. And, and that's how I feel about Pink Floyd. And getting all passionate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about your role in and contribution to rock history? Grateful. Grateful I got to have any kind of a role in it at all. Uh, grateful that I furthered what I saw as needed in music and what I wanted to be. And, and, and I have heard from others, you know, beyond me who cited me as an influence that that's what I did for them. Just being a powerful woman who could show all the emotions men show in music as a woman and be all the things that men are as a woman and be allowed to do that. That I am proud of because that's what was needed and that's what is happening now. I see all that now. You know, there isn't as much of the fear that women have, maybe a little bit sexually, because guys still like to hold women down and go, well, you can't be as sexual on stage. You can't talk about fucking. You can't, you know, because then you're a slut. And it's like, oh, fuck you. You know, it's stupid stuff. Uh, we're all sexual beings. So uh, it's still a little bit there, but not near. I mean, now Sex Ima, the song I wrote, it's nothing. You know, they're way past that now. So that's great. And, and I, I help to keep, keep open the conversations about sexuality and help women feel more comfortable with themselves and more free to express with their man or whoever about what how they feel and, and feel good about it and feel good about emotion because that's one thing that I've always been good at and, 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 and now realize that it, it is a help to other people because in, all emotion is good. All emotions are powerful and necessary and important and I've always let them out sometimes too much, but 
my mother was fascinated by that because she was an Aquarius and to her, you know, everything was very cerebral and, and not emotional. She just didn't understand emotion and had grown up in a family where emotion was not okay to express. Some emotions are not expressed at all. But in my family, she just let me do everything and she just watched, you know, and I was, I was mad, I was happy, I was, you know, I was just always everything. And so in, in music, that's something that people have told me that I've given them is, is the freedom to be mad, the freedom to be despondent, the freedom to be sexy, the freedom to be in love, the freedom to be out of love, you know, take my breath away. I was out of love. And I sang that from a place of, of loss of, I don't have any of this. It's, it's very sad when I listen to that song because I hear it in my voice. It's, it's, not, it's not being in love. It's not having it at all because I didn't. That was, that was at the height of not having love for four years. So it was just this sad person singing that song. And, but it worked. It obviously worked for the song. And people resonated with that. So I'm glad that people feel safer with their emotions and don't feel that some are good and some are bad and they can feel them all and live them all and enjoy them all while they're here. Okay, last one. Um, what are you most proud of personally and or professionally? Uh, that I live as much as possible and I continue the philosophy that my mother gave me and the people that she helped astrologically, that the universe is benevolent, that everything that happens to us here is not only for our greatest benefit, it's for our greatest happiness. She said to me, look back in your life, Terry, has anything ultimately ever not been for your greatest happiness? And I look back and I see it at the times they happened, maybe it wasn't or I didn't think they were, but now I see they were. And all the twists and turns were. And I, I love living like that because if that is true, and I now know that is true, if the universe is benevolent, then we can't lose. There's no way to lose. There's nothing to lose. There's only, to, there's only win here. And and I want people to live like that because it's so freeing and, so, and makes life so much more fun and enjoyable. And I want other people to, in, to, to not be fear, as fearful and to, in, to be in that, in that place of enjoyment as much as possible while we're here, because we're not here that long. So I'm proud that I live that way and I'm proud that I'm in my way putting into my songs as much as I can so people can be empowered by that philosophy. That's it. <laughs> Is there anything that I didn't ask or that you want to talk about that we didn't talk about? Um, I know it's like your whole life, so you got always, a lot. Yeah, yeah, I think I we're try. good. Thank you for including now me. We just have